Good afternoon and evening. My name is Rena Shukla, and I'm a public health specialist with USAID. Currently, I'm based in Islamabad, Pakistan. I'm pleased to be here today to moderate this extremely exciting panel as part of the Wellbeing Cities series convened by New Cities. The Wellbeing Cities initiative highlights leaders and initiatives across the, board, across the globe that are working to transform our cities. Today's panel is a topic that's particularly dear to my heart called Rethinking Public Health. The COVID-19 pandemic highlights the importance of health equity, resilience, and models of public health care and services that addresses a broader sense of well-being and embodies the principles of equity, access, and quality. The UN reports that over 56% of the world lives in cities. If we are to learn from COVID and strengthen public health, cities have to be central to this agenda. And integrating broader definitions and programs to improve well-being is an integral part of this process. So I'm really excited today to present our dynamic group of panelists for the Rethinking Public Health conversation. We have Mayor Musa Hadid from Ramallah um, City, Palestine, who has served as mayor of Ramallah since 2012, following his win in two consecutive local authority elections. Mayor Hadid practiced engineering for 20 years until assuming the position as mayor of Ramallah. At the Ramallah municipality, in addition to being the mayor, he heads three vital committees, namely zoning, projects, and lower tax committees. He is here today to share Ramallah's groundbreaking form of expertise project. And next we have Secretary Diana Franco Rodriguez. Dr. Rodriguez holds a PhD in sociology from Northwestern University in the US and graduated in law and economy from Los Andes University in Bogota, Colombia. She has vast experience as a human rights defender and researcher. And she's here today to share Bogota's innovative district care system um, program, which is winner actually of the 2021 Wellbeing Cities Prize. So congratulations. Um, we have Dr. Yana Ramis, partner at McKinsey Global Institute. Dr. Ramis has le led um, McKinsey Global Institute's research on productivity, competitiveness, and growth, as well as urban economies and health. Her most recent uh, research sizes the global economic and social benefits from rethinking health as an investment, not just as a cost to manage. And we have Anil Menon, Executive Vice President of Community and Urban Services at ShareCare, the digital health company that helps put people, uh, helps people manage all of their health in one place. Uh, Anil's career spans strategic leadership of business initiatives at some of the world's largest companies, advisory roles to world leaders, and various roles in academia. So I'm pleased here today to have our panelists and I'd like to um, ask Dr. Um, actually Mayor Hadith, who has spearheaded um, Ramallah's Resilience Strategy 2050 um, about how was the idea of the Forum of Expertise formulated? Okay, thank you, Hina. Uh, maybe uh, I have, first of all, to, to thank you for giving me this opportunity to be one of the panelists today to speak about uh, well-being and to share our experience in the city of Ramallah, uh, especially uh, that uh, we have to, to, first of all, to understand the context of our city in order to be able to understand what we are talking about. <clears throat> Ramallah uh, is a very small city compared to mega cities in the world. Uh, we are almost uh, less than 100,000 citizens in the city, uh, but during day daytime, we are more than triple that number because of the place and the, the role that Ramallah is playing nowadays, especially that the Palestinian Authority is located in our city. So that's one of the uh, most difficult challenges that we are facing in the city in, in terms of services and in terms of uh, standards and the, the quality of life that we are trying to give our citizens. Uh, Ramallah had the chance to join <coughs> Uh, one of the networks, uh, it's uh, an American network, uh, which is Rockefeller Foundation, um, four or five years ago. And through that network, uh, we were able to establish our own strategic plan for 2050 for the city. And we were able to figure out what, what weaknesses do we have and what are the uh, 
the, the things that give us strength and power in order to be able to, to deliver our services. Uh, and one of the most uh, important things that we learn through that, uh, that strategy is that we need to deal with all people in our city. Mm -hmm. And what, what I mean with that is that it's not about services only, but it's mm -hmm. about inclusion of all mm -hmm. parts of the city. And mm -hmm. there where we found that many projects and many programs that we are dealing with is dealing with the young people, with dealing with the students, dealing with the women, but none mm -hmm. of them was dealing with the senior citizens of the city. Mm -hmm. And that's where we started to think, how can we include these people in our strategic plan, in our vision of having them together involved in our activities, in our programs uh, and in life in general. And we started from there. At the, at the first beginning, we faced a lot of, of problems because mainly we, when we tried to do our research about the idea, we were not able to find similar ideas, especially in our regions. I know for a fact that in, in, in the Western uh, countries, they, they are dealing with senior citizens, they have programs for that. Uh, the part of them are included in the social security uh, programs. Some of them are included within programs from the, the government, from the cities, but in our region, senior citizens are neglected in general. Once you are retired, then you have to step back, just sit in, in, in your house, or maximum you can have a tour in the city once or twice a week, that's all. So that's where we started. Uh, and we, uh, we tried from the first beginning to involve those who are targeted in this project to be part in the idea. That, that was the main success of our project that we didn't plan for this forum how to run, how to act, how to involve other people in, in, the, in the forum, but we gave them the space, we gave them all the needed support from our side and we gave them also a place and we asked them to formulate the idea in the way they can take it to a success story. That's what happened. Fortunately, I'm, I'm glad that this is one of the projects that I'm proud of because nowadays I can feel how senior citizens are living in a good way. Of course, we are, we are going to talk about the public health and what the, the forum is doing for them. But the most important thing is very emotional that these people are becoming more attached to the mm -hmm. place in a way that they, they in, in, in 2020, during the lockdown of the city, they were all the time asking when we can go back to our place in order to, to be active again in, in the forum. So this is the main idea and this is how we, how did we start. That's great. Um, and it's great to hear that inclusion was a really important theme that led your work and especially reaching a population that's really overlooked. What were some of the activities that the form of expertise included? Uh, In fact, we have more than a, a program or every day we have activities. Mainly they are uh, focusing on the, the public health of the senior citizens through uh, programs in yoga, programs in sports, uh, in, in, in nutrition uh, programs for, for them, uh, but uh, 
mainly the, the also the, the, the forum was established for a reason that we need these senior citizens to exchange their experience with the young generation, with the younger generation. You know, and as a fact, what we are facing nowadays, I think it's not only in Palestine, but it's all over the world that we have this conflict between the generations, the conflict mm -hmm. between the older generation and the young generation. And that's because of the gap that is be becoming wider every day, uh, referring to the technology that the younger generation is, uh, is you know, is, is using it in, in, in a way that the, the older generation is not uh, really in, in, in the position to understand how they are thinking. So we are trying, first of all, to make the two generations more close to each other mm -hmm. in terms of exchange of experience between them. Our vision was in the first that we need the experience of the older generation to be transferred to the younger generation. And we discovered later on that the, the older generation is trying to gain from the younger one mm -hmm. their also experience in, in their life. And that was also part of, of the story that we were not figuring out at that time. Right. Uh, voluntary work is also one of the major activity in, in, the, in, our, in mm -hmm. our forum because mm -hmm. everything in, in our forum is for free. They are volunteered in the forum. They are uh, they have their own activities by themselves. They are leading the prog programs there in a voluntary work. So uh, voluntary work is, is very important. And maybe the, the last thing that I, I'm going to highlight is the uh, how they are now proactive in their community. Because mm -hmm. as, as a municipality, sometimes we refer to them and ask them, how can we deal with this issue and that issue? And we are trying also to have this forum as a backbone for other institutions in the city in order to give, to give them also uh, advice or uh, uh, at least the lesson learned from, from their previous experience. So that's part also of the activities that, that is done in, in the forum. Thank you so much for sharing. That's really inspiring, especially having that intergenerational exchange and younger and older generations learning from each other. And I think that really ties into a theme that uh, across all of our panelists, which is the importance of inclusion and also um, within thinking about health and well-being, the importance of community and, and ties, um, um, whether that's with institutions or through volunteer work or activities. Um, engaging with family and community as part of being healthy. So this is really great. Thank you for sharing um, these experiences. Um, Secretary Franco, a lot of your work as well through the District of Care program focuses on um, centering, putting more of a, a lens on the caregiver and um, taking a gendered lens on this. Um, and there's a common theme. What um, which is the main driver for the Bogota uh, government to invest in a care system? So thank you so much, Rina. And it's a real pleasure to be here with uh, Jana, with Musa, with Anil. Um, and I think this issue is absolutely vital in the topic of this panel, right? Is um, as important as ever given the pandemic, but overall it's also, revealing, and I think the pandemic has done that, revealing certain crises. And one of them is the unpaid care work crisis, right? And the mm -hmm. fact that there's a overload uh, that has historically been carried by women. So that's the main driver of Bogota's government to build a care system. Bogota has a population of 8 million people and a little over 50% of them are women. And nine out of 10 women carry out unpaid care work, nine mm -hmm. out of 10, right? 
And in Bogota, these women devote an average of five and a half hours per day to housework and unpaid care work. Mm -hmm. But this represents three more hours daily than men. So imagine what you can do in three hours if you did Absolutely. not have that burden, right? If you did not have the burden of unpaid care work, what can you manage to do in three hours? You could devote more time to studying, to reading, to sharing time with peers and family, to relaxing, to investing in your health, right? Mm -hmm. Going to health checkups, doing exercise, right? So that's the issue with unpaid care work and the burden that it deprives women of having healthy and fulfilling lives, right? And with the pandemic and the ensuing closure of schools and daycares and elderly homes, the situation worsened. Today, 30% of Bogota's female population, that is like 1.2 million women, mm -hmm. are devoted mainly or exclusively to unpaid care work. So before I mentioned that nine out of 10 women in Bogota do unpaid care work, but there's a sub portion, right? There's a percentage of, of women for whom this situation is even worse. And that's 1.2 million women in Bogota who are devoted mainly or exclusively to unpaid care work with an average of 10 hours dedicated to such tasks per day. And the volume of women increased. Or in 2019, there was 800,000 women devoted to such unpaid care work. And it increased to 1.2 million women as a result of the pandemic. So, and it's the closure of care services transferred care to homes, right? Where, but within the homes, the care, the care work was very unequally uh, distributed, right? So right. that also resulted in an increase in unemployment because women returned to work, to, to work at home. So they had to retire, they had to give up their jobs, they had to give up uh, because of the closure of schools and daycares and elderly homes, in addition to the re regular unemployment. So I do want to stress that one of the issues is that women, because of, of our unpaid care work burden, had to give up jobs and return to, to their homes. In a way, what the pandemic did was erasing years of gender gains and of gender progress right mm -hmm. um so that's that's the main driver the main driver is that um we want to avoid that taking care of others results in neglecting their own lives mm -hmm. and results in fostering economic dependency and inequality both in within the home and outside right so that's the reason we launched we designed and launched the district care system, which in a way overlaps very much with what Musa was explaining, right? Because Musa's driver are the elderly. In Bogota, the elderly are part of the driver. We focus on women and unpaid care workers, but also in those people that women take care of, which are mostly the elderly, children under five, or people with disabilities. So that is uh, great that both of your programs are working to address an issue that has a strong uh, link to economic empowerment, to gender issues, and as well to inclusion. What are some um, lessons learned that you would like to share um, based on implementing this uh, innovative approach? So what are some of the lessons? I think one of the lessons is the pandemic came with a lot of, as I was saying, it had the negative effect of reducing and erasing what some of the most important gender gains of the past decades. But also in the public sector, it was a sort of accelerator. We, it, it gave us the opportunity opportunity to put in place programs that we wanted to implement before the pandemic. So we were in government two months, just two months before the pandemic arrived. 
And we had the district care system as one of our goals. But what the pandemic did was it reaffirmed the need. It reaffirmed and it made more visible this, pan this uh, care crisis, right? And so it allowed us to work more rapidly and to establish more greater articulation with other sectors, with the private sector, with the national government, with other actors within uh, the district institutions. I think that's one of the main lessons. I think another lesson is, unfortunately, there's still a lot of work to be done to visibilize gender inequality, right? At some point, I would imagine that some arguments were absolutely natural and obvious, and it's not. And we have to find new, innovative ways to try to transform and visibilize gender inequality, both at home and within and outside the, the households. And so I think that's um, still one of the greatest challenges we have, and which is like, how do we explain, especially in, I guess everywhere, but especially in some middle income countries and that gender gender politics and gender issues and gender policies are still vital and central and we still have a long way to go. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, a lot of work, so we have here two examples of cities that are putting people um, at the driver's seat of decisions and policies and trying to increase or embody um, inclusion, equity, and um, putting the citizen at the heart of the service um, to address these long-standing inequalities. Um, next, I wanted to um, um, uh, wanted to um, bring in Dr. Rana uh, Yana Reims. Apologies, because you're doing a lot on the side of building the evidence base on why health and these kinds of programs are important, um, which is the other dimension of which is another dimension of this that helps the policymaker and programmers eventually um, plan um, investments in uh, public health. So uh, over the course of, the, of, of your career, you've been looking at investments in health. Um, how effective have you seen those investments to date? And what do you think the shortcomings of COVID-19 have exposed? Um, both Secretary Franco and Mayor Hadid pointed out that the pandemic really pointed out issues related to uh, generational differences, um, neglect of the elderly, and gender inequality, um, particularly uh, putting women at the burden of unpaid care work. Um, what are some of the other shortcomings you've seen from your research on the COVID-19 pandemic? Thank you so much. And I'm actually an economist. I'm not a healthcare professional. So the big question in my mind is that uh, the COVID pandemic destroyed roughly 8% of the global economy last year. Yet mm -hmm. economists seldom before the pandemic talked about the economic cost of health. And our research estimated that we actually every year lose about 15% of the global economy because of poor health. And that, was, that is one of the big eye-opening things for economists, because typically when economists talk about health, they talk about its cost and whether we can afford it because of in the aging population. And clearly, any economist understands that if you are just looking at the cost side and not the benefits, you are probably not going to make the right, uh, right investments and decisions. So I think when you look back overall on the history, it's pretty clear that health has been one of the big economic growth drivers. Some economic historians have estimated that roughly 30% of the global GDP is due to the fact that we have been so good at improving public health, some of the, um, some of the treatments for, for main diseases, whether it's, for example, infectious diseases, et cetera, that have basically added four decades to the average lifespan over the last 100 years. So we have done really, really well in the past. But when we look at today at the last 10 or 20 years, typically we have done much better of expanding our lifespan, but not the health span. So people are living longer, but not in better health. And the pandemic really bring, the, bring that to life as we saw that people with pre-existing conditions, whether it was diabetes or heart conditions, as well as some of the more vulnerable populations as the elderly, as Musa has already mentioned, or D Diana on the, on the side of some of the caregivers, for example, who have been working in it with populations of high risk, 
for example, it was very clear that the impact of the pandemic was very uneven. It was uneven health-wise. Some populations were much harder hit, and it was uneven economically. It impacted women as well as some of the typically low-wage service populations much harder. So I think this is a moment where for the silver lining of, of the pandemic, which has been it's just a horrendous uh, humanitarian crisis and continues to be in many parts of the world, is that hopefully it was woken up not just the economists, but the businesses, the policymakers, on the importance of thinking health much beyond the healthcare system itself. We need to start thinking of what is the role of cities in creating environments where people can grow up, work, and age in a healthy manner. And frankly, uh, the good news is that there is so much more we can do if we really make health a priority. And I'm hoping we won't waste this Ter uh, terrible crisis by not making the changes that need to be done. So as a researcher, um, and with, given all of your work um, in, economic, uh, in economics, what would you recommend or what would you share with um, policymakers in cities such as Bogota and Ramallah or at the country level to convince governments um, to invest more in public health? Well, I think the, the good news is that we can put numbers on what exactly the economic impact would be. We estimated that if you take the known interventions in the world, you could reduce the global disease burden by 40% over a 20-year time period, which would translate into $12 trillion of more GDP, which would add half a percentage point to global growth over the next 20 years. And this is a very big contribution. And it would be a contribution that would come from the fact that people would live longer on average and live healthier. We could add 10 healthy years to everyone's life on average, which would make 65 the new 55. I mean, who would want that? And that would Absolutely. mean that a lot more people would be alive in 20 years time. They would be healthier and more willing to contribute, whether it is working in the workforce or whether it is volunteering, as, as Musa, you mentioned already, that's happening um, in your part of the world on, on helping, helping uh, folks in their, in their city. But it also would mean that a lot fewer people would suffer from uh, chronic conditions that keep them from being either part of the workforce or from um, being productive. They, would be, they might be at work, but be worrying about their headache or their back pain or worry about their loved ones. And of course, we actually estimated the importance of caregivers. There is such a large number of folks who are no, who cannot work because they're caring for someone who is ill. And for that right. reason, if, if those care, care workers could look for opportunities where they might be, might be um, more able to generate income for themselves that would have not just health benefits, but also real income distribution benefits to women as well as folks who who otherwise might not have access to that income. So I think there's lots of opportunities and frankly, cities are where the rubber hits the road. Absolutely. Um, and we're seeing here two cities that have really taken innovation to scale. Um, now, what do you think, um, having followed healthcare um, and innovation um, and business for some time, how has COVID changed innovation priorities? I think, Less than priorities, I think it has really changed the speed of innovation. Just wherever you look, you are seeing innovation happening at much more dramatic uh, speed. The one we probably all have heard about is the speed at which we got vaccinations, not just developed, but also approved and on ground, I think, and, and produced. That has been, I mean, clearly much faster than we have ever seen before. And I think there's lots of lesson learned how we hopefully can continue to innovate new solutions. Because of course, if we could solve 40% of the disease burden with, mm -hmm. with methods we know, that means there is still 60% we need to work on. And frankly, today's interventions are yesterday's uh, innovation. So we need to continue to innovate on that front. But it's not just in the, in the R&D community, it's also in the hospitals. Basically, emergency rooms had to dramatically rethink their workflow when they were, many of them very, very squeezed, and many of them, many parts of the world continue to be very squeezed because of the demands. Um, cities had to change. They rethought about their uh, their streets in many cases, looking for places for people to be able to work, more people walking, fewer people driving. Businesses had to change. They needed to think about the health conditions of their workers and in many parts of the world. They're thinking about now what they should do to ensure that, that folks will, uh, will continue to be 
be healthy as the pandemic expands. So I, I do think that innovation will be something that will never look the same uh, as we look ahead because of the things that have happened past, have happened in the past uh, year, a little bit more now, unfortunately. And I really hope that it will move most importantly from the fact that we have seen most of the innovations happen at the treatment level. So when people are already mm -hmm. ill, how can we treat the diseases? Move that into primary care, care and prevention, creating the environments where it's easier for people to make the healthy exercise and diet choices, as well as making sure that the folks who are suffering from pre-existing conditions, they get the, let's say, preventive heart, heart medicine and take it every day. So some of those innovations that really mm -hmm. help people stay healthy rather than treat them when they are sick. Absolutely. And that's definitely shown by the form of expertise and district care model. Um, so um, I absolutely agree in terms of the importance of uh, focusing on prevention as well. Um, but it is quite amazing all of the innovations that have come out over, uh, over the past year and um, hopeful that we can maintain that momentum moving forward. Um, another innovation um, we'd like to share now is um, by uh, the Share Care Community Wellbeing Index uh, led by Anil Menon. Share Care is really pointing out the importance of not just looking at so individual dimensions, but also the social and community level dimensions of well-being. So um, I was wondering from all of your time working, uh, Anil, as both uh, leading smart cities, business, uh, smart cities um, as well as at ShareCare and at the World Economic Forum, what lessons have you drawn in these roles um, in promoting a more broader approach to well-being? Uh, thank you, Rina. I think, uh the answer that I might give may seem re repetitive to points that Yana and Diana and uh, uh, Musa made. So I'm just going to try to organize at least some of the thoughts that I have. But uh, let, me, let me start with that question, which is I ran uh, the global smart cities business for Cisco for 10 years. And we did projects all the way from Europe to Latin America and India and Asia, and of course, in the US. And it's interesting we built it from a startup inside the company to over a billion dollars when I left after 10 years to join the World Economic Forum. But I swear to God, if I had this understanding as I have now after and listening to you, I think we would have been a $5 billion business because the biggest challenge we face globally when we talk about smart cities is that mayors will come back or chief ministers will ask or the presidents and prime ministers will ask saying, I get it, but tell me what's my return on investment for my people? because so much of smart cities have been driven by technology companies from the Cisco's, the IBM's, the Qualcomm's of the world, where we focus too much on sensors, too much on data, too much on you know, applications and apps, as opposed to the individuals whose lives are going to be impacted in the city. And I go back to my first early days, and that's where I'm gonna to go to my next point with the mayor of Barcelona, when we started that. And I'll never forget the mayor, uh, Mayor Jordi, who asked me, I get all what you're saying. I don't understand half of what you're saying, but mm -hmm. tell me when I go home this evening, how do I explain smart city to my 82 year old mother? <laughs> right. Because right. she is the kind of person I want to take care of in my community. So how am I going to do that? So I kind of like tap dance because that was not a question I'm used to. I was used to ask so how many sensors do I need? How many cameras do I need? How do I manage my waste management system with the parking system? So um, I said, tell me what would excite her and to your average person in Barcelona. And this is what he said, explain to me how smart city program is going to help people dance more on the streets of Barcelona. Okay. And that was so, a completely yeah. different way of looking at infrastructure investments. Tell me how can more people dance on the streets of Barcelona? So it was not the best answer, but this is the answer I gave. I said, <laughs> you know, First, if there are too many cars going around, people are going to be afraid of getting hit and they're going to be focusing on the cars. So can you have better transportation and parking mm -hmm. system, better roads, so people will feel like they can dance on the sidewalks. That's the first. If the lighting is better in the evening and it's better lit, people feel more secure. And if there are no patches of dark spaces where people feel afraid that something bad can happen to them, they feel more secure to go out at night. And when they go out at night as a family, as friends, you create an environment where people feel comfortable. 
If your garbage is picked up on time and there's no garbage sitting around where it smells, people won't feel yucky. They will feel better to go out there. So that's how I can help you create more dancing in the streets of Barcelona. And, and we created the Barcelona protocol. By the way, if you do go back and look at the Barcelona advertisement, the self-advertisement, they show mm -hmm. people dancing on the streets of Barcelona for Smart Barcelona. So I, that was a lesson for me, but I never had a measure for it. You know, mm -hmm. I could go in and I can talk about how much money I'm going to save for you in electricity, how much water I'm going to save for you from the waste management and the water management system, how much parking revenues can I generate? But it never came back to why would somebody who lives and plays and works in a city care about it. it was because we never put the person in the community at the center of smart cities it was a technology that was the center of smart right. cities when we do infrastructure investments we focus on ports and roads and airports and buildings not the people who are actually going to use that and live there and how is their life and the social determinants of health going to be changed so this was a lesson I learned. Now I go back to the World Economic Forum and we've talked about a lot about stakeholder leadership, which has become a big thing now for corporations. We talk about it's more than shareholder value, it's about stakeholder leadership, which means giving back to the communities where you work, communities from where you make your business and community where your people live. And yet we have, we have no measure. ESG, we have a measure for E, which is TCFD or MSCI. We have a measure for governance, but there is no material measure and Yana is doing a lot of work in that area, but there is no material measure on S, on the social. And so for me, that was always an obsession saying, how do I come up with a consistent measure that compares a Colombia with a Ramallah, with a Mumbai, with a New York, where you can compare across in a material manner. So about a year ago, when Jeff Arnold, who founded uh, ShareCare, which is a startup, by the way, we go public day after tomorrow at a $4 billion valuation. And Congratulations. Look at that. So, but, but it exposed a very interesting thing. There is a huge demand for health. Our industry is around healthcare. There is no such thing as healthcare, it's all sick care. The right. way it, our business, doctors, hospitals, insurers, they make money on sick care. They have no incentive to have healthy people because their business model, even though they talk about value-based care is not designed to pay for that. We have not got a material. So I started getting interested in this area of community well-being. And share care for the last 10 years, working with Gallup and now with Boston University, we've been measuring not only the social determinants of health, which is a commodity, the five determinants of health, which is food access, health access, transportation access, resources actions, and job or economic access. That's there. But what does it mean for an individual? And so we look at five dimensions, your personal well-being, mm -hmm. your physical well-being, I'm sorry, your physical well-being, that is obesity and all the other stuff your personal well-being, which is how strong are your social connections, your personal connections, mm -hmm. your support. The third one is financial well-being. How insecure are you about your financial future, which gives, creates so much stress? The fourth is sense of purpose in life. Do you have a sense of purpose in life? And the fifth one is sense of belongingness to the community where you live. And we measure that and we create an index. And this is predominantly in the US, we've done it globally, but in the US, we rank every state and every metro area, and we have data down to the zip code level, so we can tell you the differences. I'll just give one more point why that's critical. What we find very often in wealthier neighborhoods, mm -hmm. whether it's in New York or in California or even in, in Cleveland, you find an interesting tape, which is you'll find a lot of people in some segments with very high personal, I'm sorry, uh, physical well being and financial well being very low self of sense of purpose and sense of social well-being, which, so you look at them and saying, oh, this is a wealthy neighborhood. This is what I want to be. You go to a poorer neighborhood, you'll find very low physical well-being, very high social well-being. Going back to what uh, Mayor Hadid said, if you go to Ramallah, they will find a very high social well-being and a very high sense of belongingness, but very low sense of purpose or very low physical well-being because of social determinants of health, lack of access to food and health. This is what we are trying to do, say, when you go into a city, when you decide on infrastructure investments, when you decide on giving big projects, do you include social determinants of health and this community well-being index as a baseline before you decide which metro project, which building projects that you could give, and how do you assess between different in, in infrastructure investments? And that's one of the areas and reasons why I joined Shared Care, because I believe this entire thing of health requires you to focus on public health, medicine, and nursing as one, not as three different industries. So I'm going to pause here and respond to any questions or comments from any of my other colleagues. 
because I'm sure they will have a lot of reactions or comments or opinions. Secretary Franco, it seems like, uh, how has it been in, uh, in Bogota with making the case for the, uh, putting the caregiver at the center? Um, because this really addresses, what Anil is talking about is really addressing that issue of uh, belonging and the social dimension, which is true. I'm working in public health, it's often hard to quantify this. And um, we're seeing, and COVID really unmasked this issue even more in terms of exclusion, in terms of belonging um, and social networks and social support networks. So how how uh, how do you make the case? How do you talk about this? Uh, and how in, in both in terms of with um, your constituencies, but also um, measurement, because that seems to be an area that everyone um, looks for, obviously, when making the case. I was constantly smiling while I was listening to Anil because I don't know if it's maybe our Latino veins, but when I was asked one day, why is the district care system important? I answered because women who are currently trapped by care work need to go back to dancing and to smiling and to socializing <laughs> and to Absolutely. hugging, right? And to just living, right? And so, so I couldn't, uh, help smiling because that's the real driver behind the district care system that you can go back to take care of yourself as a caregiver and that taking care of others does not imply breaking your social ties or or physical and mental health problems if we go back to the number, I, I noted that 1.2 million women in Bogota devote themselves exclusively to unpaid care work. 21% of them suffer from physical and mental health, chronic physical and mental health problems. That's a huge proportion mm -hmm. in terms of costs, as Jana was saying, in terms of general well-being, when we've held multiple, multiple talking spaces and conferences and just... Uh, interviews with care workers and they constantly say when we ask them if we would free up your time if we would free up two or three or four hours of your day what would you do many of them say I want to dance I want to go to the <laughs> movies or I want to cross the city and give a hug to my sister who I haven't seen in a few months or even years because I'm unable to leave the person I take care of at home Right. And so it goes back to the importance of all sorts of capital, right? It's as Anil was saying, right? I'm a sociologist, so I can't help talking about social capital and economic capital in these, right? So um, that's the real driver. And really, when we explain the district care system, and I also have that saying, how would you explain it to my aunt? I, I don't refer to my 82 year mother, but I refer to my aunt. And because there was a mayor in Bogota who would always say, how do I explain it to my aunt Rosita? And so we always go back and wherever, whenever we're explaining something, we say, would our aunt Rosita understand this? Would she be able to explain this to her other friends and to family members and to nephews and, and right? And to the people that, live the city because that's really what matters and so that I think and the moment people when I see a smile coming out of people's faces and you know that they've had the aha moment is when they understand that it translates into the personal and family well-being individually and one of the main goals I think and and, and I, I I think we could say innovations of the district care system is we've placed caregivers at the center. Usually public policies focus on, we focus a lot on the people who need care. So there's activities for children, activities for the elderly, activities for uh, people with disabilities. But implicitly behind all that, there's an assumption that somebody is gonna take uh, the child to the activity. Somebody is going to take the elderly to the activity. Somebody is going to take the person with disabilities. And usually who's that somebody is a woman, a woman who usually has to do the three things at the same time and take care of the household. And so we wanted to 
switch the lens and we wanted to put caregivers at the center of policies. We wanted to focus what are the times that caregivers need? When is it that it's best for them to take, for instance, to uh, go dancing? Or when is it that it's best for them to take a biking lesson? Because that's one of the things we do in the district care system. We teach women how to ride bikes to enhance their economic autonomy, right? Or when is it that it's a good time for them, for care workers to take uh, courses, continued education, or for instance, to finish high school? 70% of care workers in Bogota have not studied beyond high school. So we, one of the programs is that they can finish high school in a flexible manner via internet and phones and smart and apps and also by phone or making uh, computer labs available in very marginalized areas. And so, uh, but always thinking of caregivers, of the time that's most convenient for them, of what they need to make it to be able to attend to and to really enjoy those programs. So it's focusing, it's switching the lens, I would say, to focus on the individual, on the caregiver, and on understanding their needs and what well-being means for them. That's really inspiring. Amir Hadid, as you've been doing a champion in this very innovative work as well, what advice would you have for um, a city leader um, or a government official who is interested in starting um, a program focusing on an underrepresented group like the elderly. Uh, thank you again, Lina. Uh, I'm touched with, with all the speakers, with all the panelists, with what they uh, have told us. But I think the day after the pandemic will finish will not be the same as the day before the pandemic started. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have to start all on all levels start thinking about the recovery plan on the local level, on the national level, and on the global level also, because it's not accepted anymore from now on to leave anyone behind us. And that was a, a big lesson learned from the pandemic. We are now paying the price of leaving parts of this globe behind others who were uh, in the lead. So uh, we have to pay more, att more attention, to pay more, uh, to, to give more care for all the vulnerable segments of the society. Jan is talking about women. I'm talking about senior citizens. Someone is talking about children. Others are talking about uh, young people, someone's talking about economy, someone's talking about smart cities, all of us, we have to think widely from now on to give another dimension of this planet. We want this planet to be a safe place for us and for our kids. And that's why we have to start thinking in a, in a different way that all of us must work together for the sake of the safe of our children. Rina, so, may, I, may I just pick up on what uh, Mayor Hadid said, because I think it's an important point. And we talked about the pandemic and the innovation that Jana mentioned, but that's the point, right? The pandemic versus public health, the biggest difference is pandemic people were dying and you were afraid you would die. Prevention right. is longer term, so we keep pushing it away like as if this is not real. We know these numbers are real. We know this is happening. And yet we don't have the same sense of urgency around the environment and all the other features that actually has an impact on our health and our well-being. So the pandemic, on the other hand, created a sense of urgency because it's the same problem you have in healthcare, which is people will go to the doctor when they're really sick. But you ask them to take care of the diet, take care of exercise, take care of other things. In a public health is a harder job than being a doctor, in my opinion. You know, people who are in public health, I mean, they're climbing up a, uh, a running up a thing. So I'll just say one thing, which I think is an important point, And I would love to hear what Yana thinks about it, given she's the economist here, is that we treat uh, well-being, we have treated healthcare as an exogenous variable. We look at the investment we make in healthcare, investments we make, and we treat it like as if it's a driver. 
And yet, if you take just the Ramallah city as an example, and I just use Ramallah, because one of the biggest problem is that in infrastructure investment money is there. There's excessive amount of money sitting on the sideline, but they don't put it into places like Ramallah or into Detroit or into some other places that need it because they see that as not an investable project. They don't see a return on investment from a financial point of view. And yet they see it as a constant because they look at it as an exogenous variable as opposed to uh, endogenous variable. And that's where I wanted to hear what Yana thinks, which is as you invest in well-being, you actually improve the investability and the place becomes more attractive. You actually have an exponential growth as opposed to a linear growth if you do the right investments focusing on areas of social determinants of health. I'm sorry, Yana, I didn't mean to pose a question to you, but I, it, it triggered me when you were speaking. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And that is exactly right, because health is not one of the dimensions that we mostly evaluate projects on, unless it's a healthcare project. But of course, we should be thinking about investments on roads, investments on public transit, investments on bike, lane, bike lanes, as well as investments on even things like urban design. The way you design mm -hmm. a city matters mm -hmm. a great deal of whether children can walk to school, whether people can walk to work, whether there is actually access to food that is healthy or whether your only options are ones that are probably going to make it very hard to make healthy choices that keep you in good, in good shape. So I think one of the lessons that I truly hope we are going to get of the pandemic is that we, if we invest on health and if we do it across the board from thinking about how do we allocate funding, for example. Healthcare funding should not, health funding should not just go to treating those people who are in poor health today. We should be investing on keeping children, keeping workers, keeping elderly in um, able to maintain a healthy life. And frankly, given that we are in a situation where we are seeing uh, fertility rates decline, we are seeing people aging, our working age population declining, Investing on particularly children early on to make them healthy, physically making them cognitively healthy, mm -hmm. avoiding mm -hmm. trauma that is going to be extremely costly in terms of things like mental health, which is, by the way, a, a condition that impacts young people much more. It typically takes on very early on life and has a lifelong cost. All of those um, changes, I hope we will be rethinking them as we now realize, I think, much broader than we did before, the importance of health for the social and economic benefits. Thank you, Jana. You mentioned an important, um, I think, realization we've all had during the pandemic, which is the lack of emphasis on mental health and mental health being a key component of health, as well as um, our built environment and how the built environment has an intersection with health. Um, all of these other determinants of health beyond actually treating the patient with um, medicines or procedures. So um, I have a question for the, all of the panelists and that's moving forward, um, what would you do differently now in your work um, and how you prioritize and think about what you're championing work-wise um, because of COVID-19? from what you've learned, from what we've observed, from these lessons that we've been discussing, whether it's about resiliency or putting the S um, into, you know, looking, thinking more about social determinants or any of these other issues that we talk about with exclusion or inclusion, inclusion of um, underserved populations. Like one thing that you would do differently that really struck out at you. I can, I can jump in and I think it is a theme that has come out from everyone, which is I would not do any of our research without taking equity explicitly into account because that is at the core of most of our challenges. Equity, absolutely. Mayor Hadid. I think we have to include everyone in decision-making. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Absolutely. So embedding equity into the way we make decisions. Secretary Franco. Okay. I can go to Anil. No, I would, I mean, I, I, I think doing one thing is health equity is the right one, but having the right definition of health, which is mm -hmm. not about sick but looking at people at a broad level. And then the, I would say one other thing is not averaging it out. 
because there are many cities like London will say you're on the top of the game, but you get on the subway from Oxford Circus and get off at Star Lane, 11 stops away and the life expectancy drops 21 years. And you drive eight miles between Cle in Cleveland from Huff to Lyndhurst, life expectancy changes by 27 years. So, I mean, my point is you can't average it just because one side of your city or your community is do good and the other one is uh, very bad on the average, you're not okay. Absolutely. So looking at um, uh, looking at populations on a more disaggregated basis. Yeah, and that's where the inclusive comes in, but I do it at a measurement level, not inclusive in philosophy, but inclusive that you're really being inclusive in the way you invest and the way you're measuring the investments. Absolutely. Um, so we have here inclusion, equity, um, and a broader sense of health and well-being. Secretary Franco. And I think we should not, I, I agree with what all of my co-panelists have mentioned, but I think that um, we should not hold on to thinking that we should go back to what the, what the world was like before the pandemic. That we have to make the world better after the pandemic. Inequality was horrible before the pandemic and it's been, and it's been exacerbated by the pandemic. And so holding on to what the world was like before the pandemic would just do us harm. And I think we have to come out of the pandemic having a very clear sense of we have to focus on women, we have to focus on underprivileged populations, we have to focus on what Anil was saying, like on, on the issues of intersectionality, right? We have to focus on what the most vulnerable populations are living. And we have to keep in mind that our policies do not, our recovery policies do not deepen the gaps. For instance, that when we push and we put money into a sector that is, we are hopefully thinking it's gonna push the economic recovery, that it doesn't deepen inequality. For instance, there's a lot of attention built into focusing on the construction center sector, right? And we have to put a lot of money into roads and buildings and just the construction sector overall is going to bring us out of the pandemic. Well, we've, if we don't have a gender and an intersectionality approach to the recovery, we're only going to deepen the gap, right? Because for instance, that sector in particular is a very highly masculinized sector. And so if we don't have policies that actively include women in the construction sector, then the recovery is gonna deepen inequality rather than close the gap, uh, not only in gender, but from very general, like all perspectives. So that's what I would say, not hold on to what the future, the past was like and do an active focus on closing the gaps during the recovery. Well, um, we I have arrived at time, and but I'd really like to thank all of our panelists for such a rich discussion. Um, I really feel like there have been some really key important themes uh, that have come out um, related to intersectio intersectionality, equity, inclusion, um, having a broader definition of health and well-being, and innovations, as we have seen in Ramallah and Bogota, and with the um, well-being index. So I'd like to thank all of our panelists for this rich discussion. I hope we can continue this. This has like been great in terms of what we're learning from something unfortunate like the pandemic, and hopefully can use this to build back better and all dance in the streets, just like <laughs> your friends in Barcelona um, and looking at health from a broader, more interconnected perspective. So thank you very much again for this rich discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Irina, for moderating and thank you.